Welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is Pramod K. Nair. I teach at the Department of English at the University of Hyderabad. In this module within Cultural Studies, we will be looking at cell phone cultures. Why is it important to look at cell phone cultures in Cultural Studies? Arguably one of the most ubiquitous objects that determine our life today. The subject of great controversy, acrimonious debates, sociological analysis and emotional attachment the cell phone is now integrated into our everyday life. If culture studies is interested in the everyday, then all aspects of the everyday should be part of what our analysis becomes. And the cell phone, therefore, perhaps is the most ubiquitous objects, like I said, and therefore the necessity of reading what a cell phone does. Community and communication are the same etymological root, and therefore there is no human community which is not founded on communications. The communication revolution, as it is often called, has been underway ever since the modern age. Print was the first move in that domain. The invention of the telephone, the arrival of the internet, television, cinema are all modes of communication. But the cell phone is something else altogether. It transcends time and space. It's central to a lot of activities. It miniaturizes, more than anything else, multiple processes into a small handheld device. But more than anything else, more than what we have ever seen, the cell phone is a cultural symbol. It has transformed our ideas of family, social relationships, methods of social interaction, what we even understand as communication. It has changed the way we think a phone should look. It has to be integrated into our personal lives in certain ways. It has changed our language the medium in which we speak and the medium in which we read and write. It has been the central device in political campaigning. It has been something that explorers in strange parts of the world managed to use as a global positioning device to see where they are. It is used for extensive media dominated advertising. It is also used for various abusive reasons and like all technological devices has its upside and downside. One of the key aspects of studying cell phones is to understand the relationship that the cell phone right from the beginning has established and that is between youth and this particular device of communication. Studies reveal that the cell phone generation is invariably of a particular age group. Advertisements target them, they are more adept at using it and they perhaps use it more effectively than anybody else. As a result, cell phone companies and manufacturers often see them as the index of what a cell phone ought to be. Often referred to as guinea pigs of the cell phone revolution for this. The multifunctionality, the efficiency, the speed, the kind of things they need on a cell phone is invariably being asked of what the youth want. So it's not just a professional of a certain age that is being targeted, it's people of a certain age group. It has changed the way young people communicate uh, in the age of instant messaging of an abbreviated as IM. It has changed dating cultures, it has changed social relationships, it has also determined how people coordinate. One of the key roles that the cell phone place in everyday life is what is called micromanagement or micro coordination. People no longer need to set up appointments in advance. Appointments are negotiated in the process of coming together or meeting in one place. Micro coordination enables accurate location tracking, speed of movement so that you both arrive at the same place at the same time. They are modes of escaping institutional and parental control, but they are also instrumental in determining the kind of political activism you can be a part of. As you can see, the wide variety of things a cell phone enables you to do ranges from the familial to the emotional to the political. Naturally, any of these can be used for good and bad reasons, depending on your intentions. What cannot be denied is that Life without a cell phone often places you at a very severe disadvantage in terms of your own family 
the work you do and the kind of social relationships you are likely to encounter or require. We live in the age of apps, the abbreviation for applications. It has produced n number of applications for the kinds of devices we need and for the kind of devices we often use. But what is important about the apps generation is that the transformation of the cell phone from a mere device in communication which starts with hello, how are you and convey the message to the n number of functionalities and functions that previously used to be divided among various objects. The apps in any cell phone or smartphone is essentially something that converts your phone into a computer. This means instead of having just a voice transmitted information content, we now have an audio visual aspect as well. This also means that the cell phone which was once the instrument of communication is now a device for data processing, data compiling and data generating. This has a very simple transition point. When the cell phone was invented as a communication device and when the computer was already available to us as a data processing device, the question asked was can we combine the two? The result was the app. The app takes the computer process, elaborate data crunching, data transmission, data production for gaming, banking, finance, professional requirements, Photoshop, you name it and put it on your phone. That is the cell phone needs to be seen as an integrative device where multiple functionalities from multiple machines have all been combined. The second important point to be kept in mind is the convergence of all these things, all these devices and all these processes is almost entirely determined by what you want to do. Which is why WhatsApp is often seen as a user end application and all apps are effectively user end processes. The older term for it is it's customized. What does one mean by that? Suppose I am a person who relies excessively on the phone to do certain kinds of visual imaging. Then my phone's apps can be built around, can be modified so that I can use it for what my profession demands of me. People who use it say for instance education, use it to not only generate content but to transmit it, to appropriate it, to deal with it for analysis or whatever you want. In other words, app culture is the customization of several components, several processes merging into one particular device, often called con convergence culture, a term coined by the media theorist Henry Jenkins. I now want to move on to um, a more social dimension of the apps that we are looking at. Apps have a very specific advantage. It can be used to bring various people together, which is why the group as it's often called in WhatsApp, like in all instant messaging um, functions, is almost entirely connected through the process that the cell phone enables you to do. Being free and being multimodal, by multimodal I mean the ability and the functionality of sending various media forms, uh, audio, visual, um, live video streaming across uh, people brings people together. This has of course raised the anxiety that some of this is really not private enough. Privacy debates which appear in the media practically once a week now has to do with w the transmission of information via say WhatsApp but the leakage of that kind of information for various things. For instance, people who use um, cell phones for banking or finance purposes run the risk of having their data stolen, swiped and taken away uh, in the process of transmission. So the question of privacy has been paramount among the youth about the WhatsApp and other apps that they use on a practically hourly basis. Um, what does this mean? 
text messages, video messages and audio messages are between people. When they move out of the specified group, it can cause decisional interference, uh, it can cause changes in social evaluation of what you are. This means that the transmission of data is likely to open up not just new modes of communication but new forms of vulnerability. This is the reason why any new technological advancement in smartphone cultures invariably results in arguments over privacy, over data sharing. And increasingly as you can see, every new app comes with a whole new set of processes that you need to install to make sure that your privacy has been safeguarded. You download this app, you need three other apps to make sure your data is safe. You have this kind of instrument, you need to buy that kind of software. For people in culture studies, this has its own dimensions. Yes, it adds to your sense of identity, it gives you a sense of belonging. But notice that in each case, what you are doing is consumption. For culture studies, this is an important aspect that our sense of identity negotiated via a cell phone is not an innocent one. It comes to us because we consume a gadget, we consume an app. Now the counter to that would be that something like WhatsApp is a free um, system of communication and a, a free app. But profits don't come just because these are freely downloadable. Profits come because of the number of users and the intrinsic system that capitalism has put in place is with every hit something comes out of it. With every usage something comes out of that as well. My next point to do with apps and, and SMSs has to do with new forms of social interaction. I already mentioned the first one uh, of micromanagement and micro coordination. The second point I want to emphasize here is that the language of communication has changed. One only has to look at the language of the SMS complete with smileys and emoticons, dots and dashes, faces drawn and all sorts of humorous, nasty, abusive possibilities that the visuals can be used to convey. The older generation would object saying that's hardly language, that's not English or whatever language you use at that point in time between the kinds of people you are negotiating with. But what is undeniable is the nature of language is altered because the medium one gives you flexibility or restricts what you can say. Twitter's restriction on the number of letters that can be used in the tweet determines how you can pack the information you want into those two lines. You don't have an entire page in which to convey what you have to convey. As a result, the alphanumeric codes, the emoticons speak on behalf, speak in lieu of the words. SMS language as it's often called has altered our scope of language use, but it has also established different protocols of language use. How people use the language innovatively is to do with the way sociality itself is being developed. Uh, Nor Satina has argued that all sociality is techno sociality, but all techno sociality is also primarily language based. And the arrival of the SMS and the MMS the abbreviations like OMG or LOL or ROFL have managed to compress or condense language into a particular mold. Now your immediate response to that would be this is a generational thing, the older generation does not quite take to this, you would be right. Which is the point I began with. The cell phone's intrinsic connection with youth cultures has to do with the development of an entire new language, an entire system of usage that the previous generation does not A, understand, B, want to use. Um, the smartphone's impact on business, health, social life has been made possible because the company, the service provider ensures that more and more of this kind of language is made available to you. It feeds into your requirement, your needs, but it also means that you will alter your needs because of the kind of cell phone you possess. So as you can see, it's a two-way process. The cell phone gives you something to use and determines how you use it, 
but the cell phone also manufactures things so that you get manufactured in a certain way as the end user or whatever it is. The uses of cell phones are diverse. GPS, as I mentioned that explorers and travelers use, is an, in, an important instance. Nobody needs to ask for directions any longer as long as you are able to download a Google map uh, or the route you want to take onto your cell phone and its periodic updates will tell you traffic jams are ahead, road diversions are ahead, this is how much time you will need to get from place A to place B. Um, it has found interesting uses for example in adventure sports. Uh, one of the world's most difficult endurance sports is the coast to coast in New Zealand. With the arrival of the cell phone, one of the things that you can see is the position of every person in actively active at that point in time in, the ad, uh, in that particular campaign, in that particular race, um, in real time. So people who want to observe their loved ones participating in this race, it's an extraordinarily tough race. It makes you go around the coast in New Zealand actually, that's why it's called coast to coast. But increasingly, because of the GPS tracking system, you know where every individual player is. Ten years ago, people were lost in the jungles, drowned, abandoned on various deserts or hills because people didn't know where individuals were. Now, because each one of them carries a cell phone, you can actually track where they are. You know where these people are. This has altered our perception of the adventure sport itself. Now, what is it that I'm proposing to you? What I'm suggesting to you is, when you see this contender, this person in the race, moving from spot A to spot B through an obstacle, you begin to understand the kind of experience they are going through. You might empathize, you don't really know, but you might empathize with them. It alters our perception of what the race is. Oh, that's a tough thing. That's high endurance. But you also know that they are taking such risks, but we are able to now observe them. Previously, this risk was invisible. You, you didn't see them. You didn't know where they were. I gave you this example to demonstrate to you that something as routine as asking for directions and something as radically disjunctive as, say, endurance sports have both been brought together in one single app. And that's the GPS on your cell phone. Without that, we need to ask directions, but people who do high endurance, high risk sports, for them it's a, it's a life and death situation, but the app remains just this, your GPS tracking system. If you look at um, the diversification of cell phones, it has changed social structures in particular ways. Empowering farmers, which is part of the national campaign, for instance, gives them price update, crop patterns, um, weather reports the wholesale market rates, any government policy, loans available, all on their cell phone. This means that the kind of illiteracy the farmer used to possess remains unchanged in one way, but radically altered in another. The empowerment of the rural network basically translates into empowerment of the farming community. Health services which track epidemics, childbirth, hospitalization has been significantly altered because of the availability of real-time information. Um, you would have read stories about people in difficult situations having sent out a message. Um, some years ago this was a, 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 a shipwreck on a deserted island in Indonesia. One girl managed to send out one, sig one message out of her cell phone. It was because that particular message was tracked that the people were saved. Now if you look at the range of examples I have given you from the youth cultures, dating projects through to the farmers, the adventure sports and what I have just said health and um, uh, rescue missions, what we are looking at is a wide variety of applications supported by just one device. Is it therefore just a question of high technology? The answer is definitely no. Technology determines social relations, but it's also because society changes that there's a demand for certain kinds of technology. One cannot argue that 
oh, it's because of the cell phone this has happened. No, it's because the society demands a certain kind of technology, the technology arises. This means basically cell phones and society is integrally connected and changes in patterns of behavior in the society might be determined by the cell phone, but the cell phone and its apps are designed so that the needs of society can be met. Behavior patterns have of course changed. The cell phone provides you with a wake up alarm. It gives you your very ordinary calculator. It updates your blood pressure, your diets. It means that you frequently check your phone at the workplace. You upload your instant status for people to see. You share information with your loved ones. All of it has changed the way we behave. All of us know that in classrooms, in shopping malls, people are constantly checking their phones. There are famous visuals of a whole group of people sitting around a table, but each one of them is doing something else with their phones. They're not talking to each other. They are on their phones. What does that give you as a sense of a community? A community now consists of five people, each on their phones, independent of each other. But they're all together in one, in one sense. Um, if you were to think in terms of social behavior, you used to make a phone call in order to meet somewhere. Now the phone call is the meeting. In other words, what I'm proposing is texting it becomes a substitute form of social interaction. Um, instant messaging that gives updates on people's location or what they're doing ensures that places like the classroom and home are no longer separate. Even when you are in one place, you give updates to people back home. People carry their work from office via the system of transportation to their houses. This means essentially the distinction between places is breaking down because your actions can be performed anywhere. The same actions that you would perform in one place can be performed elsewhere. The transcendence of space and time, the transcendence of spatial barriers is integral to what the cell phone has done to us. Our checking of messages or updating of what we do is no longer constrained by where we are. You can do what you do in the privacy of your room or in a group or in a large community, doesn't matter where. This means basically space and time need to be redefined because our behavior can be extended into other domains. One domain in which this has had a considerable amount of impact is religion and spirituality. People who cannot afford to go to places of worship or cannot find the time can now get prayers transmitted directly into their cell phones. The scriptures can be read out to you, transmitted to you early in the morning as part of a service provided by temples and churches and mosques. It creates a techno-religiosity because your religious beliefs that you want to share with people are now very easily shared through the SMS. Um, through the audiovisual mechanisms of an MMS. Religious sentiments have been assimilated into the cell phone's culture. Another domain in which this has been of considerable influence is domesticity. Feminist readings of the cell phone have proposed that the cell phone actually means that the mother or wife or daughter never really leaves home even when she is out at work because she is micro coordinating. Did you do your homework? The food is in the refrigerator, this is what you do. Which means you take your domestic duties to the workplace. You are never free from your home even when you step out to work because you are connected via the cell phone to your children. So for the women, it has been a very gendered technological development. It is gendered for the simple reason that when, when you step out of the home previously, you would step out completely. It is no longer the case. For people who step out, you carry your homes with you. You carry your domestic responsibilities with you. You are never separate from them. People who worry about what impact cell phones have, have been speaking in terms of the loss of privacy, stalking, um, harassment, and all sorts of things that the cell phone enables you to do. The problem with this kind of assessment is that surely these things pre-existed the cell phone. The cell phone has given it a new medium, but it is not that the cell phone forces people into behaving badly. 
people have always behaved badly if they wanted to the cell phone enables them to do it in a particular way and all technology can be possibly used for good or for bad it has nothing to do with the device itself guns don't kill it's the people who handle the guns that kill you don't blame the gun for causing people to kill each other so people who wanted to kill have always been killing the gun gives them a particular instrument to do so for cultural studies what's important to note is a set of things that i'm going to list for you now one is what i proposed via henry jenkins as convergence multiple functions from various devices the computer the film the sound system all converging onto one particular device the integration of multiple functions and multiple processes into one specific device is a crucial thing second micro coordination and micro management which changes the nature of social interaction and social relations third the problems i pointed out uh, technology being gendered means that the kind of freedom that women used to have at one point is no longer the case and this is something culture studies pays attention to all technology in some sense does change gender relations what is it that the cell phone changes this is something to be asked we need to ask questions about the corporatization of um, apps of the advertisements that we get tired of the kind of products that are sold to us in the nature of cell phones next we have to pay attention to the changing nature of behavior and language the kind of language that has evolved because the phone enables us to use certain kinds of linguistic and visual devices the next thing that to be is to be kept in mind is within the domain of social behavior what happens to questions of privacy what happens to questions of the nature of intimacy when cell phones can be intrusive can be recording devices can be used for various purposes if you notice all these questions are not directly about technology as much as the using of it for culture studies because we are interested in how people use things and how people use things within groups or as individuals whether it's family or community or township the question of what a technology does is a techno social question i'm emphasizing this because we cannot any longer think of sociality devoid of a technological connection for culture studies it's important to see all social relations as technologically mediated and therefore the nature of that mediation is open to scrutiny and it's not the task of technologists alone couple of other things that have to be kept in mind when speaking about um, cell phones and, and, and smartphones and their role in our lives one is the emphasis on instantaneity and contemporaneous this means our focus now is more or less on synchronous communication instant messaging as it's called is literally that the emphasis on the instant you can always not respond to an email you can always defer replying to a letter but instant messaging by definition forces synchronous communications on you if you remember a few months ago there was a controversy over the newest development in whatsapp that the blue tick mark indicates that you have read the message and if you do not respond to that that's considered socially unacceptable what is this supposed to be doing it suggests to you that if you are not part of the quote unquote instant you are being rude you are being socially non communicable this is a significant development in behavioral studies as well because i might always choose not to respond to something at that point in time but the accusation is but you did read what i said and you did not respond that makes me non communicative or incommunicable or just a plain rude person the emphasis on the instant is something that can be a little worrying for the simple reason that we become subject to the process of communication rather than to the process of anything else that you might be doing at that point in time if you are on whatsapp and you have not responded even if you are busy then you are deemed to be rude in other words communication gets the upper hand in the midst of all the other processes that you are doing whatever activity you might be at that point engaged in that's one thing to be uh, to be kept in mind the other aspect of this is also important and this is the update cultures that we live in now what do we mean by update 
update is the sharing of a particular moment this could be the update of the weather the traffic conditions or what x or y is doing update culture also means that the question of time difference doesn't exist we all share a moment the messaging that comes to you from across the seas and the message that comes to you from the next room unites all three of you which is what whatsapp does if you have a whatsapp group where half of you are in the united states and the other half here you're still connected in terms of the messaging which suggests a unification in time even if there is a separation in space what has that got to do with us it means in sheer philosophical terms our older notions of separation in space and time are not valid any longer the instantaneity of communication does not account for spatial or temporal distancing they have been rendered invalid in 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 a, in a very definite sense there is a third part to this for people with particular health conditions the cell phone enables a constant reminder of medication check up and the monitoring of data cell phones are part of a system where your home medical system and your medical facility that's the hospital or the doctor uploads information about your blood pressure or your sugar levels onto your cell phone this is more than likely to result in some further developments in in the small device which was once just a communication device what i'm referring to here is the increasing medicalization of our lives because the cell phone integrates health data into whatever you at that point want to do it reminds you that it's time for your checkup this is what your blood pressure was last month this is what you need to do what is important is you are not allowed to forget a medical condition the cell phone functions as a specific mnemonic device where the integration of the health services health data from home and your body constitute a loop the cell phone integrates you as a body into a much larger health loop increasingly in the west um the data from your health provider which is your physician or your hospital is sent via cell phone to you there is no way you can forget your medical condition but it also means there is an extraordinary amount of pressure for you to monitor yourself the monitoring of our own health parameters is now practically second nature to all of us and this is where the health and the cell phone cultures begin to fit right into each other the next part of what i want to say has to do with the conversion of private memory into public memory cell phones that record a public act or a social act uh, the most recent case would be the dimapur lynching whose uh, visual evidence exists because the participants themselves recorded what was going on some of you might recall the saddam hussein execution which was recorded by a warden in the prison where he was executed against all laws the cell phone recorded this what is important is my memory of a particular e event or incident circulating in a group of say 15 people then become social memory social memory now is a sum total of individual memories pooled together and then becomes the memory of a community our memory of the saddam hussein execution or the dimapur lynching or the protests that took place after the december 2012 rape are not because the corporate media filmed it are not because the state provided that information it's because we as participants developed an image put that into our phone and transmitted it what i'm proposing here is we all participate in an extraordinarily social system of part of participatory surveillance where we surveil each other the cell phone with the camera is now part of surveillance culture where all of us are surveillers we don't require a pan optical model where a policeman is watching us we observe each other and violations violence fraud or other acts which were previously not recorded by people like us are now something we record social memory now consists of individuals participating in a larger system of surveillance by surveillance please understand i do not necessarily mean the oppressive system of surveillance created by a state i'm talking of surveillance as 
something that we all engage in by observing each other. Our sense of being a public is made possible because we observe ourselves as a public. When for instance we record a traffic policeman riding without a helmet on a bike without numbers, what is it we are doing? We are saying, look, the law keeper is breaking the law. We define ourselves as a public because we safeguard ourselves as a public. This shift from personal to public or social memory, this shift from being surveilled to being surveillers is made possible because of the technology of the cell phone. And this again is a matter of interest for cultural studies because it changes the nature of everyday observation. It changes the nature of our behavior. I saw this. I record it. Previously, I would see it and pass by. Now I don't. So for cultural studies, the nature of everyday has been changed because of the arrival of the cell phone. Thank you.